All right, so welcome to Online Privacy Basics. I'm Jakavri, I'm the Digital Services Librarian at Watertown Free Public Library. And um, if you have any questions, you can either put them in the chat or wait until the end, we'll have time for questions. So to begin, what is privacy and why is it so important? So privacy is protecting your personal information from getting into the wrong hands. This is everything from your login to your email account, your bank accounts, your credit card numbers, uh, logging into online shopping, basically anything you do online. If you're not careful, someone else can get to it. So privacy and security kind of go hand in hand. Privacy is protecting that information and security is how you can kind of lock down the access to it. And there's two parts to this. There's internal and external threats. An internal threat is something that is in your computer. So that's if you click on a link in a phishing email or if a virus or malware gets installed on your computer. An external threat is someone from the outside trying to hack into a system or into your computer. So the first thing we'll talk about is Wi-Fi security. Uh, I know we kind of live off of Wi-Fi now and everywhere seems to have its own Wi-Fi network, whether it's Starbucks or the grocery store, Target. Um, and a lot of these networks are unsecured. Now, unsecured network is a network that doesn't require a password to join, and it doesn't have any encryption of the data that's uh, transmitted over the network. So if you can just log on without having to actually put a password in, that is an unsecured network. A secured network is encrypted, and it has a password to protect it. There are a couple different encryption um, protocols, like WEP and WPA2. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of difference what kind of encryption you're using. The important part is that it is encrypted. Now, data without encryption can be read by hackers with the right tools. So if you, say, log into your bank account, the login information for your bank account is passed through that network with no encryption, meaning the data isn't scrambled. It's just plain text. So they would be able to see you were on this website, you entered username, you entered password. But if you're using an encrypted network, it's gonna come out as a scrambled kind of code, which is a lot harder to crack. Now, public Wi-Fi can still be used, um, but you wanna make sure that no login information is transmitted. This is even if you're already logged into the site. So if you're on the Wi-Fi at the grocery store, don't go to Facebook, even if you're already logged in, because it's still having to transmit that information. Also, securing networks is important even if you're at home. So if you have an unsecured home network, especially if you're in, say, an apartment building and other people can see that network, someone else can log into it and use it for their own devices. So say I have my network at home, I don't have a password on it, someone else can connect to that and say pirate a movie. And then my uh, network, my internet provider sees that and sends me a cease and desist notice because I downloaded something I shouldn't have, even though I wasn't the one who actually did it. Also, if you're using a mobile hotspot, whether it's a standalone unit or if you're using your phone as a hotspot, make sure you're making that a secured network. Uh, there's different options depending on the type of phone you have, but make sure that you are switching it to a secured network and you're putting a password on it. All right, so most people are having smartphones. Um, I have an older one, but still works. I do miss my flip phone though. Um, there are a lot of different settings and things that the smartphone can do, but the first thing I want to talk about is the location services and Bluetooth. So depending on your permissions, location settings can actually transmit your location without your knowledge. Um, especially if you have something like Facebook, 
the Facebook app where it may be geotagging you everywhere you go. And not only do you not really want Facebook to have this information, uh, depending on how you have Facebook app set up, it might actually be displaying publicly where you've been, where you're going. Um, also with Bluetooth, if you're not actively using something with Bluetooth, you're going to want to turn it off, partially because it drains your battery, but mostly because someone else can actually access that Bluetooth and um, use it for their own devices. So say you have Bluetooth in your car. Uh, usually there's like an activation thing, but if someone else can kind of tag that Bluetooth speaker, they could actually play something over your car speakers. The only thing is, um, if you're using something like Apple's Find My iPhone, you're going to want to leave your location on because if you turn off the location data, you're not going to be able to use that service. So if you do accidentally lose your phone or it's stolen, you won't be able to recover it in that way. But with every smartphone, you can set permissions per app. So if you want that app to have your location data, but not, say, Facebook or uh, whatever internet browser you're using, you can change it to what you need. Also, if you have a system update, um, you need to install them as soon as they're ready for you. I am guilty of not doing this because I hate when they change the way the UI looks, but it's really important because most of the system updates are for security purposes. And even though it seems like the updates come out really, really quickly. That's because as soon as they find a security flaw, they're trying to patch it. So if you're like three patches behind, that means that there are several different security flaws that people know about and have documented how to get through them that you're not protecting yourself from. Also, when you're downloading apps, make sure you're only downloading them from verified sources. So with iPhone, you want to stay with the App Store. With Android devices, you want to stay in the Google Play Store. However, some of the apps on these stores are also um, not safe. They try to take them down as fast as they can, but as people upload things, uh, not all of them are caught. Sometimes you might see news articles about, oh, Google Play removed a million apps because they were all bad. So when you are downloading an app, make sure that um, if it's not from a company you're familiar with, take a look at the reviews, see how many reviews it has, if it's from an actual app developer or just some random person, uh, really take a look at it before you install it. If you're no longer using an app, you can go ahead and uninstall it. If you need it again later, you can always re-download it. But if those apps have any sort of security vulnerabilities, that can be exploited even if you're not actually using the app. Also, if your device is lost or stolen, uh, depending on your operating system, you may be able to remotely wipe the device. Both iPhone and Android have functionality for this. Um, the process depends on your phone, so I'm not really going to go into that. But there are options for that. And also, if you're going to sell or recycle your old device, Make sure you take out any SIM cards, any SD cards or external storage, and factory reset the device. Otherwise, there might be all sorts of old login information that you don't actually know is even there, but the next person who turns on your phone might have access to it. One of the other things that you can do to protect yourself is use a VPN. A uh, VPN is a virtual private network, so it's a secure connection to the internet that can hide your IP address and encrypt data between your computer and the VPN. Uh, it's kind of thought of as like a tunnel, so you're ignoring everything to the sides and going straight to that network. So the good thing about this is you can appear anonymous and you can set a completely different location. So I don't currently use a VPN, so my IP address shows as I am here in Massachusetts in this city, and someone seeing that on the internet traffic can tell that. If I use a VPN, 
I can tell it to show that I'm in California. Or I could say, hey, show me I'm in England. And then I can use the English Netflix. So that's kind of, you can use it for other things other than security. Um, a lot of people do use it to see other countries' Netflix um, offerings. VPNs, however, are not immune from hacking. Um, it's a server just like everything else. While they do have more protection and more encryption, that also does make them a target. It's not necessarily dangerous to use a VPN, but there are times where um, it might affect your internet speed because it is passing through another system. And some things may have difficulty accessing um, a site, or I think Zoom actually has issues if you're trying to connect through a VPN. Also, a lot of them cost money. So it's an additional subscription on top of what you're already paying to use the internet. There are some frequently used VPNs. Um, ExpressVPN is very highly rated. NordVPN, um, I've heard good things about Private Tunnel. And then Tunnel Bear, like an actual like grizzly bear kind of thing. Um, that is a free VPN option that is fairly easy to use. The one downside to these also is that a lot of them have data limits. So if you're using your internet a lot, um, you may hit a data cap where you won't be able to use the VPN anymore that day. And it's usually around 500 megabytes per day. So there's also phishing and malware. So these are some of the threats to your system. Phishing is when someone is trying to convince you to give you, to give them your log information and they're doing it through some sort of trickery. So this can be an email with a fake link. Um, it can be an email saying, you know, you need to do something about your account, even if you may not even have an account with that institution, but it's, it's trying to make you, uh, afraid enough to click a link so that you accidentally give them your information. A lot of times it's easy to spot. Frequently phishing emails are misspelled, they're impersonal. Um, if they have a link, you can put your mouse cursor over the link and it will look different from what it's actually trying to send you to. So say you get an email that your Bank of America account has been compromised. You may not have a Bank of America account, but you're still getting this. Um, now, if you do have one, then you're like, oh no, what, what am I supposed to do? But they've had a link in the email. So it may say like www.bankofamerica.com. But then if you hover over that link with your email, or sorry, with your cursor, um, it may say like boa-login.co. That's clearly not the actual website, but it's trying to redirect you to something under their control so that they can get your information and try to get into your actual account. Uh, fake login pages are really the most dangerous of these because they can make the page look exactly like the legitimate login page. Uh, it's very easy to just copy an HTML file, which is what an, a web page is displayed as, and just upload it to another server with a different address and then have it send to a different server instead of what you're actually supposed to be logging into. Another thing is that they may attach different files, um, especially if you have anything that's trying to attach an exe file that's an executable. That's any sort of program that would be running. And that would usually install malware. Malware is software that is installed or installs itself on your device. And this can be anything from a virus to something called a keylogger. And a keylogger is something, it's a program that runs in the background. You may not even notice it. But what it does is it records every single keystroke on your keyboard. 
So if you type in you know, www.amazon.com and then you click the login button and then you type in your username and then you type in your password, it has saved every single keystroke that you pressed on your keyboard, including if you, you know, accidentally put in a letter and had to hit backspace. It records that you hit backspace and then it records what you put in again. So key loggers are definitely dangerous and it's usually hard to spot them if you don't know what you're looking for. They can be anything from a program that's just running in the background. It's not causing any, um, it's not causing your computer to slow down at all. It's just a weirdly named service. And if you don't know what you're looking for in the services that are supposed to be running, um, you can, it also goes to the same point, if you're, if you know what you're looking at, but something looks suspicious, um, you may be going through your tax manager and having to like Google everything that's there and going, oh, that's just something that Windows added. So it's definitely something where you'd have to kind of pick and choose whether or not something looks vulnerable and then just research it. So to get around that, if you are getting an email with an alert about an actual account that you might have, just go to your actual, like the web page that you're used to. So instead of clicking that link in that email, go to the Bank of America website, log in through there, see if there's any messages, or do a virtual chat or just call, well, probably not call them right now because I'm sure everyone's swamped with phone numbers. Um, but in a normal situation, you could probably just call them and ask, hey, is there anything going on with my account? I got this email. And then they would be able to actually verify whether or not uh, something was going on. But generally, companies are not going to email you to ask you for a username or password. They're not going to email you and ask you for any personally identifiable information. Uh, so some best practices, just make sure you know uh, if what's being sent to you is legitimate. Um, if something asks to install itself on your computer, um, if it's something that you did, just make sure that before you actually go to install it, that it's from a legitimate source. There's a lot of free software out there that has other things kind of tucked into it that can um, either be exploited or have vulnerabilities or just there's something that's malware that's tucked into it. Um, if you get an email and it appears to be from someone, you can actually check. Um, there's a couple different ways to check, but usually if you just hit the little drop down, I'm thinking of Gmail right now, um, it'll show you the actual email address that the message is from instead of just saying the name. And if it looks like it's an address that's maybe not legitimate, a lot of times it'll just kind of be like a keyboard was smashed to create the email address. You can go ahead and just report the, the message as spam or delete it. Also, ad blockers for your browser can help protect you from malware. Um, one of the people, or sorry, one of the things that people can do with advertisements on web pages is put malicious code in them. And as the ad loads, it will try to install something on your device. Ad blockers keep that ad from loading at all. And a lot of browsers now do have the capability to see that that's happening and flag the website as unsafe. Um, you may see that if you are using, say, Google Chrome, um, it'll pop up with a red screen and ask if you're sure that you want to keep going. Uh, usually, if that pops up, something has been flagged on that website that is malicious and is going to try to hijack your computer in some way. There's also private or incognito mode. Uh, with this, if you're using this mode, you can go to a website and your browsing history is not tracked, your any cookies or information that's downloaded from the internet 
once you close the window is completely wiped. So it does protect you in that uh, anything that might be downloaded locally is gone. However, that's not going to protect, um, like your I, sorry, your internet provider is still going to see anything that you've done. They see the traffic that goes through their network, but nothing on your computer is going to carry over into another browsing session. So there's a couple different options for this as well. There are browsers specifically dedicated to pro private browsing. Um, also for searching, most people use Google because it works really well, but Google also tracks pretty much everything, especially if you have a Google account, you can actually go in and see, um, so like if you use the map app, Maps app, it um, tracks where you've been, where you've looked at, um, if you've looked at something more than once, it'll tell you when the last time you looked at it was. So there's a lot of kind of tracing of where you've been on the internet. Um, there's also the joke that Amazon will suggest things for you to buy that you've dreamt about. Um, it really depends on what you're doing. They will try, to, most of tracking is trying to advertise to you based on what you've done and what you've seen. That's not really malicious tracking. It's, I mean, it's definitely privacy invasion and a little disconcerting, especially if you just mentioned something, you know, in passing and your phone happened to hear it and then is suggesting it as an advertisement. The problem is when those systems can be um, attacked by someone with malicious intent. So while the people who are doing the tracking may not have that malicious intent, someone else can exploit a vulnerability and hijack that. So the purpose of that private or incognito mode is to clear that out so that there's not this whole backlog of where you've been stored locally on your computer. You can also do this if you're not using a private browser or incognito mode, you can clear your cache manually. Um, you can limit how many cookie or what cookies are stored or um, access to other plugins like Flash or things like that. Um, also, a lot of things you'll see like um, permissions pop up. So do you want to allow notifications? Do you want to allow location access? Instead of just clicking allow on those things, you want to actually really read them and make sure you want to give these things access. So one of the things that you can do is a privacy checkup. Um, passwords are the biggest thing here because strong passwords are really your best bet against uh, kind of brute force hacking and that's when someone can get your username but they can't get your password. And there's uh, software that they can run to just try millions and millions of different password combinations per minute. That's why sometimes they'll want like an uppercase letter and a lowercase letter and a number and a symbol and more than this character, but less than this character. And I know it, it's really frustrating, especially when you want to just use one password that you can remember, but you really want to make sure that you are using strong passwords. Um, I'll get to password managers in a second, which is a, what I think you're referring to. Um, with passwords, my suggestion is always, if you're going to pick something that you want to try to remember, think of a word, um, not a very common word. Uh, I personally use a word in French because um, that's, they're going to assume, based on my location data, that I'm probably speaking English. So I'm grabbing a word from a different language, um, substituting letters with numbers or symbols. So like for an E, you can use a three. For an I, you can use a one, uh, things like that. Make those easy substitutions where you can just kind of switch it on the fly. 
uh, but you can still remember because if you remember the word, you can kind of remember how you manipulated that word. I am guilty of this, but try not to reuse your passwords, especially your email password. I know your email probably seems like the most trivial part of privacy, but if you have everything connected to one email account, as soon as they have access to that email account, they can change that email account on all of your accounts and that makes your account that much harder to get back into because all they have to do is they get that email that says, are you sure you want to confirm that you're changing your email? And once they've changed your email, they can just say, oh no, no, someone's trying to hack into my account when they're the person that actually hacked into your account. There are definitely some password managers that are secure. Um, and what that is, is it's basically a lock system that holds all of your passwords. And then it itself is password protected. There's a couple different ways that these work. Some of them just directly put in your password information into the browser or program for you. Um, some of them are just a kind of vault or repository if you happen to forget your password. Um, Google Chrome now actually suggests passwords for you and then saves them. Uh, I prefer not to use that just because the passwords are never anything that would ever make sense. So if for some reason you're not using Chrome, you don't have access to that password it kind of assumes that you're just going to be using Chrome for that. And say if you need to get into a system that doesn't even have Chrome into it, on it, but you need to access something, you're not going to be able to get to it. And then you have to go through the trouble of um, recovering your account or resetting your password. Um, but that also goes for if you're using some sort of app to uh, manage your passwords as well. If it's not something that you can take with you, it's a little bit more difficult to use. Uh, I know a lot of people just have that book that, <laughs> that they put all their passwords in. Um, I'm not gonna knock that. I know it's not the most secure thing, but if you're not carrying that around with you, uh, the odds of someone like breaking into your house and stealing your password book are fairly low. Um, obviously, if you're using a computer in an office, you don't want to write down your password and have it somewhere near your computer. Um, but having that repository of passwords written down somewhere can actually be helpful. Um, in personal experience, after my mom passed, I had to deal with all of her accounts and she had it all in her planner in the address book. So I'm not going to knock the manual password thing. Um, if that's what works for you, just make sure that that book is secure. Don't take it out of the house with you. And um, if you have some sort of like place where you keep all your important documents, I would put it there. Uh, so another thing is to check your firewall and network settings. I know this may be a little intimidating if you're not familiar with how to even get to these things, but your firewall is what protects your network from the internet at large. Um, it's what's keeping things in or letting them out. So you can think of the firewall as a set of doors. Some doors are going to be locked, some doors are going to be open, and some doors, um, things will have to knock and you choose to open them. Um, however, when things install themselves, they may ask for your permissions and you can just you know, hit the allow button and go on about your day. Uh, phones do have firewalls, but the firewall settings are nowhere near as accessible as on a computer. Because um, the firewall is really going to be in the computer and on your router. Um, routers have their own firewalls, and especially if you have like a modem router combination. Um, but also with a router, if you get into that, then um, there's all sorts of settings in there as well. Um, 
I'm kind of my household router manager. So I can kind of go in there and know, okay, well, I can do this, I can do that. But if you're not familiar with how to do these things, you really want to look up a guide or um, have someone who's familiar with them to really walk you through it. Because there are a lot of settings and while it's easy to break something, it's also really easy to fix it. Um, there's also, there's usually a return to default button if something goes wrong. Uh, but firewalls, you can accidentally turn off your access to programs or, um, or different services because you denied something. But usually it's just easy enough to just switch it back to allow. Uh, network settings, especially if you're on a public network, you want to make sure that you're not adding um, file sharing access. So if you are file sharing across a network, um, you want it to be a private network and you want it to have a good reason to have those files shared. Uh, for example, you can have a shared drive that's completely separate from your actual hard drive. You can have it on a server. But if you have a folder on your actual hard drive shared, anyone on that network can see it. Excuse me. And if they see it, they can usually either delete things, change things, add things, uh, depending on how the permissions are set up. Uh, now this can be helpful sometimes, especially if, so you don't have a flash drive handy and you need to move files from one computer to another uh, within the same household. And you can just, instead of trying to upload to the cloud or email, you can just put it in a folder, um, set the permissions to share, and another person on the network can just grab the files, but then you can delete that folder so that it's no longer on your computer. Um, another thing you wanna do is to, one, have antivirus software, but once you have it, um, keep it up to date and have it run scans frequently. This doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, if you have Windows, it should come with Windows Defender, which is actually pretty good now. Um, and I think it's set to automatically run scans either every day or every week. Now, when it does the automatic scans, the frequent ones, uh, that's going to just be a kind of surface level scan of the files that are frequently changed. Uh, so you do want to go in and periodically do a deeper scan that scans the entire computer and all of the files. You also need to be aware of any data breaches or hacks. Um, for example, Equifax or Target, when they were compromised. Uh, your information may have been compromised, it may not have been. But there are different software, um, or sorry, different websites where you can actually check your email address. Um, you can see if someone has your password in a password list. Um, because if it may not even be a password that you used, but if someone had the same password and that password was compromised, um, a person using a program to brute force a password can just run that entire password list against a username. And if you happen to use the same password, then they get into your account. Um, there are several different sites where you can do this. One of the uh, most trusted is something called Have I Been Pwned? And I'm gonna spell that out for you in the chat. I think that's .com, but I'll, I'll verify that once I'm done with the presentation. Um, you can put in a password to see if that's been um, compromised. You can put in an email address and it also collects a list of different breaches. So you can kind of browse through and see, okay, Yahoo was breached. Um, do I have a Yahoo account? If I do, I can put in that Yahoo address and see if that has been um, part of a hack at some point. And then from there, you can either, um, depending on if you even use the account anymore, 
uh, for example, my Yahoo account um, was part of the data breach. I was no longer using it, so I shut it down. So if you do have the old accounts, um, you can just shut them down. Just make sure that if you have any services that maybe still have that as a password recovery email, um, that you can go back through and change that before you do shut that account.